of things that we're working on around women and girls, investing in women and girls and investing with a gender lens, um, but to make sure that we leave enough time for active discussion from the audience. So as we're speaking, we're not gonna take Q&A along the way, but we would very much like you to write down the things that you'd like to ask about, talk about, and since we have so many experts sitting in the audience as well as up here, um, we may even call on a few of you to share your own story or your own perspective. Um, so just to give you some context about me, I'm, I am an entrepreneur turned investor. I built a company in the edu educational technology space and I am passionate about investing in women entrepreneurs and companies that positively affect the lives of women and girls. And my view around this topic of um, women and investing is really a number of different lenses. And so because we're all gonna be speaking from these different lenses, I thought I would just set a minute of context around that. So when we talk about investing with a gender lens, that could be that we're talking about, and, we're, and I'm talking about impact investing, um, could be that we're talking about women entrepreneurs. It could be that we're talking about companies whose products and services positively affect the lives of women and girls. It could be that we're talking about companies where ownership, equity, good employment, women in the supply chain, where gender equity is throughout the company, whether it is male-led or female-led. It could be a company where that's really working on an urgent human rights issue and the purpose of the business is to really address something around slavery and trafficking or violence against women. So it could be when people talk about investing with a gender lens that they're thinking about women as the investors, whether that's individual investors or fund managers or people who are deploying capital. So we're coming from these different kind of perspectives on the topic and we're glad to see as many men in this room as women because this is not a women's issue. This is a men and women's issue. So I want to thank IntelliCap uh, and SanCalp and Diffid and USAID for making it possible for us to have this session here because we think in a way um, we shouldn't need to have a session around women and girls because it's half the population. It's really in, it permeates every conversation at this conference. And on the other hand, it's really good to be able to focus on the issues and opportunities that are there today for us. So we're asking questions like, who is at the table in the conversation around these investments? Who benefits? Who says who benefits and who really benefits? What are we counting and what counts? Who is in that co-design process as we're thinking about products and services, as we're thinking about business models and distribution and marketing and financing? really where is the decision making happening? And so where do women show up in any of those perspectives? So I wanna ask your indulgence with me for a minute. I'd like you to all close your eyes for a moment. <coughs> and just breathe in and breathe out. And keeping your eyes closed, imagine a world where there was no difference in women's entrepreneurs' access to capital, where women fund managers had the same level of access to capital, where funds directed at women's empowerment across energy, health, agriculture, education, financial services was equally available, where labor rights, safety, human rights of women and girls were respected and was a given in the investment conversation into a business, into an enterprise, that it didn't even need to be on the table because it was expected that that is how a business would behave and would look through its supply chain. That deal structures and incubator structures and accelerator structures were appropriate to what worked for men and women alike with families where men's needs in families and women's needs in families were addressed. 
How does this feel? What does this look like? Is it joyous? Is it smart? Does it feel impossible? Does it feel powerful? Does it feel like that image is just that image unleashes possibility for you when you think about that world? Now, open your eyes. How do you feel? How do you feel? <laughs> so we're going to talk about this world that we're all really out here trying to and, and working to create today. So I want to start with Patty Alleman, who's here from USAID. She lives and breathes gender. She's thinking about gender across Asia. She's an amazing woman in a powerful place. Please give us your perspective on the ecosystem as you see it. Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks to all of you for joining us in this panel today in discussion, which we really hope it will be interactive. I think, you know, closing my eyes just a moment ago, this is something I, I think about every night and I wake up every morning and I feel um, joyous because I feel that USAID and in all of our other development partners, we've been doing this for decades. In our investments, we really have seen the value of investing with a diverse um, approach and an inclusive approach. Gender being one of the key dimensions because that's a, it's, a, it's an incredibly important barrier and opportunity across all of our um, work that we do. And the reason we've done this and we do it very rigorously in looking at all of our programming and looking at what are the opportunities and barriers and when it comes to gender. And we, we specifically try to address those barriers. We put funding toward it and we have the metrics in place. And when I looked at the work that was going on around gender lens investing, and, and it's not just looking at the social outcomes, it's really looking, does it make business sense? We know it makes social sense, but does it make business sense as well? And I thought that we had a lot to give to that discussion. And so what we were able to do in the last few months is with a, numerous partners, we did a scoping exercise across Asia around how could we accelerate gender lens investing in Asia. And we identified over 150 people in Asia who are actively working in this field. And we also identified about six opportunities, six activities that really are ongoing, that if they were accelerated could, could just be game changing for the field of gender lens investing in, as, a, as a whole. And I think that's what motivates um, many of us up here, is that we've given face to what gender lens investing is in Asia. And as we go along, I think we'll talk more about those specific opportunities. But I would like to echo one thing that you said is that, and, and I think this is a challenge, by coming into this, this session that is investing in women and for women and girls, this is not about not investing in men and for men and boys. This is about there are inequities in the world and the value for, the, for social and for economic growth is being inclusive. And just recognizing that and part of that equation is looking at what are the barriers for investing in women and specific opportunities that are really game changing for women and girls. And that's why we're taking one piece of what is a large field of gender lens investing and specifically talking about that today. Thank you. And I'll come back and ask you, I'll come back and ask you more questions about the different players in the ecosystem that are coming together mm -hmm. from investors, accelerators and incubators, those working, others working with entrepreneurs and intermediaries the philanthropists and the role that they have to play, the role of government and public sector, kind of how this web is being woven. So, fellow investor, um, Rina is here from a very exciting new fund, and I am so glad to have you here 
to share the perspective. Tell us a little bit about this fund, but also what, what are you looking for as an investor? Because this is an investment conversation. Thank you, Suzanne. So I am here, um, I have a background in mainstream finance and moved back to India and got involved in the impact investing space <coughs> and have recently decided to start a fund with my partner Shloka. Um, and we, we decided to do this after the AIF regulations changed at the end of 2013 where we were allowed to actually start angel investor funds in India. One of our main motivations is to actually mobilize domestic capital and more than that we want to mobilize domestic capital from women. So the name of our fund is Sankhya. Sankhya means number, and as Dr. Mahajan told us yesterday, it also means that, that what we're doing actually counts. <laughs> but what it also means is balance, and that's what we really want to sort of bring to this space as investors. Um, you know, first and foremost, when we think about development, what we really want to do is to sort of work on the income balance, we want to work on the gender balance, and we want to work on the capital allocation balance. Um, and, and, and the problems of poverty, as we know, are very heavily gendered, um, and, and, and they, they are complicated by sort of caste, region, and, and, and religious issues in India. So what we're trying to do is that we really want to actually achieve this balance by mobilizing women investors. Now, now why aren't we going to men? And we've often been asked that question. And, and the reason is not because we want to exclude men, it's because we just want to include more women. And if we were actually going to open it up to both women and men investors, we would probably get very qualified male investors very quickly. Um, and at that point, we would not have the time or the patience to actually educate or motivate women to become investors in this space. So uh, the goal is to set up multiple funds over time to help shape this movement. And we'll know when we've made some serious progress, when, when we have a fund that's open to both men and women, but we still have an almost equal number of men and women on our, on our list. So in, in terms of what we're looking for, we're really looking for motivated women that we can educate and bring into our fold and collaborate with, and then invest in businesses that have an impact on women and are, and are entrepreneurial neutral in terms of gender. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to come back and ask you about some of the things that you're hearing by talking to investors and what's what's exciting them and what some of the barriers are, but what, where, where that conversation is going. So let's switch gears and talk uh, about from the investor, moving from the investor side to the entrepreneur side, because at the end of the day, um, we are really just enablers, and it's really all about what these amazing entrepreneurs are doing in the world. And so Teresa Chiroje, Teresa, Chiro yeah. Teresa um, is gonna share with us her story, and she's here from Kenya. Yeah. And thanks to um, you for coming all the way this way to share with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Teresa Njoroge. And uh, I'm a social entrepreneur from Kenya. Uh, recently formed a cleaning company called Clean Start. And I'll bring in the perspective of other social entrepreneurs who are trying to fill in the gaps that we have and as representatives of these women who we are talking about, because on a daily basis, we interact with these women, we know the issues that they face, we hear their cries every day, and we do appreciate uh, all the stakeholders coming on the table to see how do we you know, fill in these gaps, how do we meet the needs of uh, all these women who for a very long time have been forgotten. Um, I'm an ex-banker, uh, switched to a social entrepreneur, and uh, it wasn't voluntarily. Um, what happened is, um, six years into my banking career, I unfortunately handled a fraudulent transaction. Um, unknowingly, as I handled that transaction, it opened a journey that um, brought a lot of experiences and learning of what happens in the other world, so to speak. Um, and I started the journey in the justice, the judicial system in Kenya. And um, you get to learn that justice is not for all. Um, and as much as I've not focused on that area, 
of criminal justice reforms in Kenya, it's an area that really needs to be looked into because you will not go into the court system in Kenya and in most parts of Africa and get justice. What happened after the two years of, of, of going in and out of court and pleading my innocence, I ended up being imprisoned with my daughter for a whole year. And what that meant was I had to lose my job immediately and my career as a banker. And that was the beginning of experiencing what this women go through. Women who are from very poor backgrounds, who are illiterate, who have no means of, decent means of livelihood, and have been pushed to the edge because of the poverty situations that they are in, and trying to fend for themselves and their families, get caught up and trapped in a revolving door of crime. And uh, after spending a whole year with these women and listening to their stories, one after the other, um, I had already had my work cut out because something really had to be done to get them out of this desperate situation of alienation. And um, it's a vicious cycle that they really do not know how to get out of. So eventually when I got vindicated and got out and back into the community, I immediately started a social enterprise, uh, an advocacy team and called it support me in my shoes and this was purely to create awareness to the community of the issues that these women go through in the rural areas people who are from settlements and who, who whose voices are never heard and uh, as i continued uh, creating the awareness i did get assistance to get these women to get uh, capital to start their small micro business ventures and um, as much as I was dealing with about a thousand women the total number that was in this trap was about 20,000 of them in and out of different facilities in Kenya who are from very very poor backgrounds so the women I'm talking about are not criminals these are people who've really been pushed to the edge because of their poverty background but the number is much larger of those who are living in chronic poverty. And um, after walking this journey for a while and uh, getting support to assist a few of them out of, of their situations, it, I had to look for a way to make it sustainable because the numbers are large. And at that start, starting point of your journey, it's very difficult to do a proposal and take to a funding agency and tell them I want funding to, 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 to get this work going. And that's when I came across SPARC. SPARC is an accelerator from all the way from Australia. And with all due credit, we have Mr. Aaron Tate, who's the CEO and founder of SPARC in the audience. And um, after going through a whole week of incubation with them, and uh, presenting to them the problem that I had at hand and the desired impact that I wanted, they helped me through the whole week go through strategic planning and uh, understanding of how to work it to help these 20,000 women. And uh, that's when I came up with the solution for Clean Start, which is a cleaning company where we train these women uh, professional office cleaning uh, skills and look for contracts for them to uh, form the platform whereby they now, after going through the training program, get the jobs as cleaners, get a salary, and we manage that salary for these women to eventually start their own micro business ventures, and it's a variety of them. Uh, but just from an introduction point of view, that's, that, that's where we are from. Yeah. You have such an amazing story. We could spend the whole, could spend the whole rest of the afternoon talking about that model and what's evolving in that model. But we'll wait here and we'll come back to that. Okay. So um, we are really excited to have a guest from Bihar, two guests from Bihar, Mrit Jay Tiwari from the Akhand Chodi Eye Hospital 
you have, I've just gotten to hear his story and I, you know, again, I wish that we had an hour here, but it's gonna need to be a short way of telling us what you're doing, why you're doing it, what, you're, what, what really is the essence of uh, the model that you're creating. And um, it's so great to be able to have you here to um, also speak from the perspective of being that person who's in the training and in the, um, in the work that you're doing. So thank you, Mela, for being here. <clears throat> thank you, Suzanne, and thank you all, all of you here for, for being here. Uh, I am privileged to be the only male member in this uh, female <laughs> panel, but uh, I would like to share my uh, story in short. Before that, I would like to give a brief introduction about Akhanjyoti Eye Hospital. This hospital is in Bihar, two hours from Patna, in uh, set up against, uh, amongst paddy fields. And we started this nine years back, and we moved from 10 beds to 500 beds from 2,000 surgeries a year to 70,000 surgeries a year. Out of 70,000 surgeries, 55,000 surgeries are free to the patient. Uh, we have a paying model, we have a non-paying model also. Although this hospital is run by a trust, but uh, we are looking at all sorts of uh, grants and investments which actually make us viable because the quantum of work is so huge. Now, where do women fit into this high hos eye hospital? Actually, 90% of the workforce of the hospital uh, is women. And most importantly, it's the, you will find a lot of hospitals, a lot of other enterprises, uh, especially in states like Bihar, where women are working. You will find ASHA workers, ANMs, you will find a uh, lot of self-help groups of women working. But uh, if you actually go to them, most of them, despite having money in their hands, they still marry their daughters at 17, 18, they still give dowry, and they are still not standing up against domestic violence. I've had the privilege of working with girls, young girls, uh, in the last eight, nine years, and uh, I, I can only say that uh, their self-belief has actually changed the way I look at the girl child itself. And if you look at the hospital setup, it's not merely about jobs. It's about trying to create role models. We need role models on a mass basis, especially because India is about the villages, and especially in states like Bihar, we need role models not imported from Delhi or Mumbai, but created at the local level. Local level, why? Because they are the ones where they can actually identify them. Uh, we have with us uh, Mala. Uh, Mala Singh uh, is also from Bihar, my colleague. And uh, in fact, I have not taken the great leap of faith. I, uh, although I belong from Bihar, I was born and brought up in Calcutta, so I already had that change thing inside me. But she was the one who had to take the great leap of faith. I would like Mala to share her story, then we can probably take up the session. My name is Mala Singh, and I am from Delhi and from Mumbai. I am from Bihar, from Vaisali village, from a small village. और ये मेरा पहला चांस है जो मैं पहली बार बिहार से बाहर आई हूँ और इतने सारे लोगों के बीच मैं बोल रही हूँ तो अगर मुझसे कुछ गलती हो तो माफ करिएगा आप लोग आज मैं जो भी कुछ हूँ मैं एक ऑप्टोमेट्रिस्ट हूँ और यहाँ तक मैं पहुँची इसका सारा क्रेडिट मेरे सर मृत्युंजय तिवारी जो कि मेरे एक रोल मॉडल भी हैं और अखंड ज्योति आई हॉस्पिटल को जाता है अगर अखंड ज्योति आई हॉस्पिटल नहीं होता तो हो सकता है कि मैं किसी गांव में दो बच्चे की माँ बनी होती और घर में बैठ के रोटी बनाती रहती आज मैं यहाँ तक पहुँची हूँ तो अखंड ज्योति आई हॉस्पिटल की ही बदौलत है और मुझे आज भी वो दिन याद है जब मैं पाँच साल पहले अखंड ज्योति आई हॉस्पिटल में आई थी मैंने वहाँ आके पढ़ाई की इंग्लिश बोलना सीखा कैसे पेशेंट चेकअप करते हैं वो सीखा यहाँ तक कि कपड़े कैसे पहनते हैं और बाल कैसे बनाते हैं ये भी मैंने वहीं आके सीखा और उसी का नतीजा है कि आज मैं एक ऑप्टोमेट्रिस्ट हूँ और उसके साथ साथ मैं एक फुटबॉल कोऑर्डिनेटर भी हूँ Mala is from a village in Vaishali district, which is uh, about uh, 60 kilometers from Patna. 
and she says that uh, if the Kanjoti Eye Hospital wouldn't have been there, then she would probably have been uh, in a village uh, with uh, several children and uh, cooking uh, rotis over there. Uh, she uh, feels that uh, when she came five years back to the hospital, uh, she learnt English over there and uh, then she learnt how to examine patients. In fact, how to wear clothes properly, how to tie her hair also, she learnt uh, from there. And she feels that if the hospital wouldn't have been there, then I wouldn't have progressed. And in life, I had a lot of जब मेरा लाइफ मेरे लाइफ में मेरे लाइफ से एक पर्पस जुड़ा और मुझे अपने आप पे गर्व फील होता है कि मेरे पास एक पर्पस है मेरे लाइफ में एक उद्देश्य है नहीं तो बहुत सारे लोग तो मर जाते हैं और उनको ये भी नहीं पता होता कि उन्होंने पैदा क्यों लिया था उनके लाइफ में कोई उद्देश्य नहीं होता लेकिन मेरे लाइफ में उद्देश्य है और मेरा उद्देश्य ये है कि मैं एक रोल मॉडल बनूं अपने अपने लोकल लेवल के जो भी मैं जहाँ से आई हूँ वहाँ की लड़कियों के लिए वहाँ मैं हर साल 25 से 30 लड़कियों को रोल मॉडल बनाऊँ ताकि वो समाज में क्रांति ला सके और उन और लड़कियों को उनको अपनी जगह दिला सके। She feels that becoming an optometrist was an honor for her, but most importantly, she feels that she now has a higher life purpose. Uh, within her, she feels that a lot of people die without even knowing why they were born. But she feels that she has a higher life purpose and that life for her, the purpose is uh, as a role model trying to develop uh, 25 to 30 new role models for girls every year and sending them to the villages of Bihar. My dream was to play football. But my father gave me a reason. He gave me a reason to play football in the society that you don't play football. Why? Because I was a girl. लेकिन इस अपने को साकार किया हॉस्पिटल ने अखंड ज्योति आई हॉस्पिटल आने के बाद मैं पढ़ाई के साथ साथ वहाँ मैं फुटबॉल भी खेली और गोलकीपर बनी लेकिन मेरे लिए ये मायने नहीं रखता है कि हाँ मैं बाहर जाके खेलूँ इंडिया लेवल पे खेलूँ लेकिन मायने तब ये रखता है कि अगर मैं पैंतीस चालीस साल की उम्र में जब मेरी शादी हो जाएगी दो बच्चे की माँ रहूँगी और उस समय जो कि फुटबॉल मेरा पैशन है मेरे नस नस में है उस समय क्या मेरा फैमिली मेरा पति मेरा समाज मुझे इजाजत देगा हाफ पैंट पहन के ग्राउंड में उतरने का या नहीं लेकिन मैं उतरूंगी और मैं खेलूंगी ये मुझे पता है क्योंकि उस समय मैं एक जागरूक नारी हूँ माला ऑलवेज वांटेड टू प्ले फुटबॉल बट शी वाज डिसुएडेड बाय हर फादर बिकॉज़ ऑफ़ द लोकल प्रेशर but uh, when she joined the hospital uh, because of the education through football program at the hospital, she was able to play football and uh, she became a goal goalkeeper apart from being an optometrist. She feels that uh, uh, whether she goes to the India team or any other team, that's not important. What is important is football is a passion for her. Will at the age of 35, 40 when she is married with kids, will just for the sake of heck of it, for the passion, if she wants to play football, will her family, will her husband allow her to wear shorts and come out and play football? She feels that she'll be able to do it because she's now uh, 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 uplifted her level. Hospital mein aane ke baad, main Facebook chalana, Google chalana, ya WhatsApp chalana sikhi. Aur uske dwara hi bahut logo se mera sampark bhi hua. Aur bahut logo se pariche hua. Unme उन लोगों से भी जान पहचान हुआ जो नारी जागरण की बातें करते थे लेकिन मैंने ये पाया कि नारी जागरण की बातें करने में और जमीनी हकीकत में बहुत जमीन और आसमान का फर्क है और सरकार बहुत सारी योजनाएं बना रही है साइकिल बनाई है लड़कियों के लिए साइकिल वितरण की कपड़े वितरण की क्या इन सभी से लड़कियों की परिस्थिति में बदलाव आया है मुझे नहीं लगता है कि आया है अभी भी क्योंकि अभी भी लड़कियों को दहेज के खातिर प्रताड़ित किया जाता है घर से निकाला जाता है उनके कैरियर पर किसी का कोई ध्यान नहीं है सिर्फ शी माला फील्स दैट देर देर आर बी लॉट ऑफ स्कीम्स फ्रॉम द गवर्नमेंट रिगार्डिंग डेवलपमेंट ऑफ गर्ल्स लाइक द साइकिल डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन स्कीम्स और डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ क्लोथ्स एंड ऑल but is is the really uh, is the girl child really empowered? Has she actually we've been able to do good for her? She feels no, 
and uh, she learned Facebook, WhatsApp, and all these things here at the hospital. There are a lot of people who talk about women's empowerment, but what is happening on the ground is completely different. So, um, Rich and Jay, is there anything else before we move on that you want to share about this um, transition from the, the different elements of the business to now thinking about what, what happens next? Personally, I feel that uh, this session is basically on investing in women for women. Investment has to be on four fronts. I think, uh, number one, it has to be on nurturing talent at the village level. Number two, creating jobs at the village level. Number three, create, uh, imparting employable skill, skills to them. But most importantly, trying to create role models at the local level on a mass basis. The more the role models, the greater is the chance that uh, the actual empowerment will take place. Because you see, uh, do, uh, just uh, being employed somewhere and earning some money won't help unless there is a change in attitudes and the thought process. The behavior pat, the investment has to come in. How do we change the attitude and the thought process? In fact, personally, I feel policy makers, decision makers, government, uh, semi-government, whatever, I think they should uh, before actually implementing or making a policy, they should stay for one year in an Indian village, actually understand the conditions and then actually make that policy because you need a bus and they give a submarine. Yeah. So that doesn't help. Thank you. So as an investor, I'm going to come back to you, Rina. Um, how do you look in due diligence at the deals that you're making as a fund manager um, uh, at all of these different attributes and you know, how does that come together for you and your due diligence? So because we are sort of focused on gender, we will look at a lot of the criteria that you mentioned before, Suman, about you know the fact that the organization has to be producing either products and services that cater to women, or they have to be addressing a specific social problem for women, or they might be led by a woman entrepreneur, or they will bring women employment and create role models. Um, and, and, and some of the some of the sort of questions we faced have been about pipeline, and, and, and mm -hmm. one thing that we feel very strongly about is that there is a lot of pipeline in India. We we don't think that there's a problem with pipeline. Um, and, 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 I, and I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about sort of the pipeline that we have. Um, so, so so one of the deals we're looking at potentially is a women's farmer cooperative with over 50,000 women coffee farmers that produce organic coffee that is being test marketed to highly sophisticated customers in Europe. Um, another entity that we're looking at is a skill development enterprise that focuses on training primary healthcare workers, and a large chunk of this population is women, nurses, paramedics, and so on. Um, another company that we're looking at is a rural distribution company that distributes out of, um, out of the box, um, but distributes life-changing products to rural consumers through, through local shops. So, so if you sort of come back to the criteria, it's not just about the finances. I mean, and we strongly believe that social returns and, and financial returns go together. If we do our jobs well, then our investors will make money. So, 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 so certainly from the point of view of sort of the types of companies, um, these are the types of companies we're looking at. But one other thing that we that we put a lot of emphasis on is the management team and the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. We feel very strongly that there has to be trust between us and the entrepreneur, and that we have to work very closely with the entrepreneur. And, and that's something that is really instinctual, and it's and it's something that that one develops over time, and, and it comes immediately. So it's about trust, instinct finances, purpose, motivation, vision, all of that. Thank you. Patty, mm -hmm. as you think about the different pieces of the ecosystem and we're talking about the investor perspective and the entrepreneur, what, what else are you seeing around what's, what's you're excited about and what's needed? Hmm. We could spend hours on that, <laughs> but I'll, I'll spend just a couple of minutes on what I think from a government perspective, because I think what Sun Kalp has done very nicely in bringing um, coming to Delhi is to see how can we partner together to actually address some of these issues. And so from the government perspective, um, particularly from the, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, where I work, 
We are looking at opportunities, particularly to work here in India with people like Rina, of how can we can build upon the partnerships that we have. We have very good relationships with country governments here in India, the, the government of India here, with state governments here. How can we build upon that in our private sector partnerships, our, our colleagues in other um, development agencies, such as the Germans and the British? How can we build upon that partnership and that leverage that we're able to bring to really advance how do we identify. It's like Rena's saying, it's not an issue of not having the pipeline. How can we make the pipeline more robust? How can we bring more investors to the table to invest in these enterprises? Whether it's the women-owned enterprise, the enterprise that's a man or a woman-owned that has significant women as employees or has strong policies against violence in the workplace, or the supply chain is definitely um, focused on women, women in the supply chain, or products and services for women and girls. How can we build a platform where we all come together to really accelerate this? That's an example of one way that we look at how we can engage in this space. I think we also don't just look at building platforms within countries. Some of the work we're doing in the Southeast Asian region with the ASEAN economic community is how do you then work with those nations who are coming together to say what policies can they have in place to really move forward, let's say women entrepreneurs, as a collective of ASEAN. How can those women entrepreneurs come together, take off their hat of only a woman entrepreneur who has her business and become a, a person who knows how to attract investment? How could you set them up in some sort of holding company where they own who, what kind of investments are coming in to benefit multiple women entrepreneurs? Or men and uh, male entrepreneurs who are producing products and services that are beneficial for women and girls. So the other thing I think, and it's just to build on the point, I think we would all love to live in a village of Bihar for six months. I, I, and, I, and I speak for myself, I speak for many of my government colleagues that I work with in all different countries. We can't. So I think that the benefit of that is that we, what we really value are the partnerships and, the, and the, the knowledge you bring of how it works to find what's the, the model that has produced the um, employees for your hospital that makes you the most, um, the best business model. So it's not just been good for the communities in Bihar, it's been good for your business success. And I think that's what we're trying to find, those opportunities that we can help spur for a little bit. And build that evidence base. So maybe I'll take my hat off as a moderator for a minute and I'll put my hat on as the investment director for a project called Spring, which is a venture accelerator that is in East Africa now but will be coming to South Asia. It is funded by DFID, and I will say DFID was meant to be on this panel, but because, as you might have heard, it's an election uh, period in the UK, and until May 7th, they are not able to participate in a public forum. Um, but I'm funded by DFID, so I can speak. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it's DFID, it's Nike Foundation, and it's USAID that have come together as the first three funders on this accelerator, which has a very specific purpose, which is to accelerate companies that directly and positively affect the lives of adolescent girls in poverty. These are rural girls and urban girls, younger girls and older girls, girls that are in school and girls that are out of school, helping them learn, earn, save, protect themselves and be protected and invest in their own economic future. And it's starting in Kenya, Rwanda and Uganda and then moving on to Ethiopia and Tanzania, and then to Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh. And we are lucky enough to have the time to really be designing not only this direct acceleration of these 80 to 100 ventures, but to really think about how we enable the ecosystem that's already emerging in these countries to think about girls and what role they can play. So to think about what is the role of local accelerators and incubators and Spark who would be ex incubating ventures that would then be candidates for spring? What is the role of investors, not only in the region, but globally, who want to invest with a positive effect on girls? If you, if you were to call your broker today and say, hi, I want to go long on girls. <laughs> I, want, I want you to show me a mutual fund and I want to show you a, yeah, I want you to, I want to see a deal, an individual investment, I want to see a venture investment, I want to see a mutual fund. It's girl focused. You know, I've done this, by the way, it's just for laugh with my, with my guy. 
<laughs> uh, and um, it, you know, I get a very long silence on the phone. So we're really, <laughs> we're really out there to build pipeline, um, and we're also out there to build an evidence base about what works and doesn't work for girls. What business models, what distribution models, what marketing and communication approaches, how to work with NGOs productively, their core part of the picture to make sure we're working with girls in safe spaces, how to do really human-centered design, girl-centered design from the very beginning, and to show what that kind of innovative approach really looks like. Um, so bringing together entrepreneurs, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the investors, philanthropists who are making grants in some cases to these kinds of ventures and the NGOs that are working with them, and corporates who have incredible capacity to help these ventures uh, and to really learn about India, Africa, Southeast Asia, the future markets for so many of these businesses and girls, 250 million adolescent girls out there in poverty who are the future workers, leaders, entrepreneurs, managers, investors. Mm -hmm. um, this is a market to learn about. And so this is a way that development and business and the investment community are coming together to say, and I wish you were in East Africa, we're gonna have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to say, how can we lift up those great examples? How can we help accelerate them? And then also, how can we translate that to say, where is the South-South collaboration opportunity? And I've been having great conversations with many of you about, are there ventures here in India that could come and apply for next year? Because the businesses don't have to have been originated there. They just need to have a really strong base there. So that's just a little bit of a, where can these, uh, these pieces come together? Um, so, Teresa, since I was just talking about um, Kenya, yeah. um, and you're, you're not only an entrepreneur yourself, but you're incubating other entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. what else do you need? What else are you finding valuable um, from these, these different kinds of players to support you in your journey? Um, other than the education part of it, of course financing is an issue for uh, entrepreneurs who are looking into scale and have a wider impact because the numbers are huge yeah and you definitely need a mentor because um, you have the solution in mind you have the desired impact that you want but how to go about it to achieve the desired impact you really do not have it figured out and that's where the role of the mentor mentor mentors comes in and uh, a lot of the accelerator programs offer this, and uh, I'm lucky to have found this through Spark, you know, because I'm getting mentorship, I'm getting advice on how to grow Clean Start step by step, and uh, impact on the grow Clean Start to impact on all these women around. So it's finance, which is the number one issue to scale and reach as many as you would want to. Uh, there's the education bit of it, the mentorship. You really need a coach to keep guiding you on how to get the best impact out there. Yeah, and then of course, and, the, you've, and you've got some local mentors as well as global mentors. Exactly, right? exactly. So they're, they're they're bringing in on your table all this expertise to really help you uh, solve this problem because it's not just a local problem. The, the same problems we're having in Kenya are the same problems that are right here in India. And um, other than that global perspective of it, uh, there's also need for an ecosystem for the social entrepreneurs, you know, what, what solution is working here and how can we replicate it uh, in, in Kenya to uh, sort of have these numbers cut down. So do you think that would be interesting to actually have a way, because I know we're talking about connecting, especially in spring, we're connecting our entrepreneurs with each other and other entrepreneurs across these countries. Do you think it would be interesting to have a South-South entrepreneur connection? It's definitely very, very key to have this exchange of, of how are you doing it here, how this is how we do it here, exchange of best practices and see how best we're going to reduce these numbers. Because at the end of the day, uh, she represents all these women that we're talking about who would really, and I'm very, very honored that she came to share with us her story because she's the, she represents the reason why we are here, mm -hmm. you know, 
th th this is the reason yeah. why he and I wake up every day to make sure that they get that best impact, you know. Yeah. So if it's working best here, I could get some bits and take back home and share with many other social entrepreneurs. So that ecosystem is very, very important and we need more of what San Calc is doing, for example, yeah, to create more of these platforms. Yeah. Richard Jay, we had a conversation about how this is not just the right thing to do, but it's a really smart thing to do from a business perspective. Can you just say a little bit more about that as I'm sitting there in my investor hat now? Yeah, I think uh, when we try to analyze for me, I try to analyze social impact first, and then of course the financial part and the, the return on investment kicks in. It is also a smart thing to do because if I, uh, at the hindsight, eight or nine years back we started this program. Today I am not dependent on Delhi, Mumbai or Chennai for manpower. I have a local pool of talent, like Mala, whom I can tap, and who are there, who are there with me working passionately, and we are there for a pretty long time. So it makes business sense actually if you are, uh, 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 if you are trying to improve the lot of the girl child and women and at the same time you are creating a pool of talent because in the healthcare industry one of the major problems is retention of manpower, getting skilled manpower. So that pool has been created. So it makes business sense from that point of view. Plus. Import, most importantly, uh, we also have this spur for growth, like uh, Mala, uh, from next month, she will be leading a vision center manned by 20 people. She started uh, on a very small scale, now she is a leader. So even for le looking for leaders, I do not have to pay the sky to take people from, sorry to say, from the big management institutes. So she is there, she has done it, she has seen it, and she has proven. So I get at, uh, if I look at it commercially, I get at uh, very uh, economical cost, if I put it that way. So it makes sense, uh, business sense, merely by having that local pool of talent. Thank you. And a culture and a passion yep. for, that changes retention and so many other things. I, I would just like, uh, I'd like to add a point here. It, uh, please just do not think about employability. Mere employment will not suffice. The next level which is developing that employable girl into a role model, that has to be fulfilled. Without that, change won't come. Otherwise, it will merely be having money in the hands and the age-old problems will still stay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we have so many great people in the audience and so I want to turn to some of you uh, for some comments and some questions and um, I also want to say I'm very proud to be wearing a necklace that is also a great example and I know John you're here somewhere there's a husband and wife team uh, that has a business here that started as an NGO called Made by Survivors how many of you heard of have heard of them um, and they are uh, now launching a business called Releve and I um, I don't know if you can see this incredible necklace but John, can you just give us a minute about what you're doing with Releve and like how this ecosystem would support what your transition is? Sure. So let me back into that. Um, how the ecosystem supports it. So what we're doing with Releve is we employ women uh, who have been in the shelter systems in India, mostly because they're human trafficking survivors, rape survivors, Speak up. Uh, domestic violence survivors. So we're employing people out of the shelters and trying to, women out of the shelters, to give them higher incomes that allow them to go back to their communities and be a role model, which by the way I think is a superb point. Something I would not have known until we started doing this, how important it is for these women to return to their communities as often, in our case, the highest wage earners in the community mm -hmm. has had a huge impact, not just on their own children, but on other members of the community. Um, so we, I've uh, been working now in India for 10 years, but this particular model has been going on for about three years. And what we can, I'm really pleased to see this conversation go from conversation, which is kind of where I thought it was five years ago. People would sit here and talk about women's issues and how we can help women, to actually seeing funds starting, starting that focus on this issue that are funded and run entirely by women. I think we've finally gotten to the point where the transition has become less about talking about the issue to actually doing more about the issue. And placing capital, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, speaking of someone else who's placing a lot of capital with a gender lens, Jen Price is sitting in the back from Calvert Foundation. Um, do you want to add anything about your perspective from the Women Win, Women sure. Investing in Women project? Thank you, Thank you uh, for the opportunity to share and um, be, you know, John, what John was saying, having examples out there, I think this is the key thing that we saw when we created Win Win back in 2012, building off a comment Suzanne said, calling your broker, or calling your financial advisor and saying you want to go lawn and girls, lawn and women in dead silence. And we wanted to start to change that paradigm and have a product that, yes, you could invest in and those proceeds would go and empower women and girl um, organizations that were empowering women and girls. Um, so we went about creating a pilot program of uh, $20 million dedicated to this. Um, and it was a pilot, so we learned a lot in the way. And one is um, just simple things, language matters. So connecting with a woman investor, we learned is a lot different language. And sales curve, than <coughs> engaging with a male investor. So very simply, it takes a lot longer to transact and have them purchase your investment product, but they'll, re they'll buy it again. Um, a sale to a male investor is much quicker, um, but I don't know if you got them for long. <laughs> <laughs> and I will extrapolate that into real Let's life. Let's go there. <laughs> that would be for a drink in the bar later. Exactly. <laughs> but just, um, it, 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 it is a fascinating um, first step we took that unearthed a lot of other lessons um, around how do you reach women investors, the language you use, the sales channels you use, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what we aimed to do was just show it was possible, that you could create a product that was um, directed towards women investors, and, people, and women would purchase it. And lo and behold, it's happened, and I would say, in the US, there's now multiple products. Root Capital is one, there's now mutual funds that have a women's lens, and we're on our way. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one other, uh, just quick point from a company that's really scaling, that's got a strong women effect. Can you share a little bit about what's happening with Mela? Sure. Um, so we work with artisans across India, usually in underserved or rural areas, and we create a market for them. We have a brand in the U.S. that's sold in all the top department stores. So moving from the fair trade boutique approach, to getting into Bergdorf, Goodman, Neiman Marcus, and Bloomingdale's to really kind of create a platform. A lot of the groups, again, um, we don't just work with women. We work with both men and women. And uh, some of the groups that we've worked with, for example, there's a group called Shrujan in Gujarat. They have 3,000 tribal women. And I've actually spoken to the founder, and she told me that through that work of income generation with women, people actually changed their whole philosophy around girl, you know, girl child. So people wanted to have girls more than boys in that area because, uh, because of the income generated. And then as a personal level, I just wanted to add, as a women entrepreneur, there are some major, people are always surprised to hear me talk about this now that I'm based in India. I talk, you know, people think, oh, this is just an issue at the field level or only in India, but in the US, I've t gone to conferences like this one. I've talked in front of rooms of all male investors. And I can, you know, I work with my father. We co founded the company. I can tell you I'm treated very differently when I walk into a room by myself and when I'm with my dad. So I kind of had to just learn when to just push him forward and just say, talk to him. You know, and you have to adapt, but it's really a big problem for women entrepreneurs. And I'm really glad to see more funds like Sankhya. I know there's a group called Pipeline Fellowship in the US, but that's a big area that we need to work on. And, and I will say, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm an investor in four venture funds. I'm a really active angel investor as well. And in the venture funds that I'm in um, so far, because I didn't have the venture fund that is now coming, um, I've looked for where is there a gender lens, and Grassroots Business Fund is one of them. Is there anybody here from Grassroots Business Fund? So um, there are projects like Jaipur Rugs and Mother Earth and incredible ventures that Grassroots Business Fund has been financing that have you know, 60, 70, 80% women. Again, it's not just about counting those women, but it's about looking at the quality of those jobs, their management roles, their, effic their, their voice. In, uh, in how those businesses are run. Um, really looking across the whole picture. So it's not just the, um, the funds and the vehicles that are directly focused on gender, it's also the possibility of those that are not directly focused. So I said I was gonna take questions. Um, there was one back here, do you wanna start us? Yeah. Uh, 
Hey, does this work? Okay. First of all, thank you very much to the panelists. Um, Mala, your story is incredible. Congratulations and onwards and upwards. Um, coming from an athletic background, I work closely in the sports for development sector, um, specifically with female empowerment through sport. And in some of my findings, um, I realize that there is a disempowerment that happens with empowerment sometimes when women and girls are empowered to the point where they rise beyond their society, their cultural, uh, the family cultural beliefs and values, and then have a very alienated style of living, and then end up withdrawing back into the cultural systems that, uh, you know, I guess suppress what they're trying to do. So I'm really keen and I'm working closely and hard on trying to include the men specifically the fathers, um, the community, um, in the empowerment process. And I was wondering if I could get some advice, um, if you had some information on how you do that. Thanks. Uh, that was a very valid point. I think uh, what uh, uh, we learned from our experience was that uh, initially when we started, uh, one year down the line we felt that Girls like Mala were li living in two different domains. One inside the hospital, which was a completely different environment, and another when they go back to their villages. That's a different environment. So it was important to sensitize at the local level, at the village level also. And it starts with the father itself. So uh, five years back, Mala's father, if I remember, he was like, uh, do I need to sign any agreement or something? We generally say that, uh, see, you, you will not marry her before 21 years of age. So now she passed out last year and now she is employed at the hospital. Her father, when he comes in the meetings uh, which we have with parents, he says, what is the necessity of marrying at 21? Sir, let us do it at 27, 28 also. <laughs> that enabling environment is very important. So that enabler, if you see, on a standalone basis, he cannot be sensitized. It has to be the environment which has to be the enabler. And that will start with the girl itself. When Mala goes back to, uh, when she came here, she was introduced to a proper washroom for the first time. When she goes back to her village, she talks about washrooms uh, with her father and mother. Then her father comes to know there is a scheme from the government where they can have at a very, they can have low cost affordable toilets. So it, it is these things, it's actually the girl which starts translating to the parents, but the real enabler will be the atmosphere, the environment. If we can get the parents, see for, they see the teachers coming all the across, uh, like uh, what we found was that English was a problem. English where the girls, even at the A levels and the O levels, the English wasn't enough and the uh, teaching and training is in English. So we had a rota of English teachers coming from all across the world volunteering over there. Now when a father comes in, and he meets these English teachers, shares their views, his also thinking starts going up. And actually, uh, now the situation has come to a place where he, uh, not only Mala, he himself is now an enabler trying to imbibe the same thing into other parents to send their girls over there. So talk about role models, then the guy becomes a role model as well. Uh, yes. Men, yes. Right? Yeah. Thank you. It's a fantastic example. Yeah, no, I mean, what we found in our work from a gender lens investing is that the people and the activity going on in Asia is much more um, robust and innovative than I would say is going on from the U.S. or Europe. <laughs> and it's a matter of how do we make this into one field and get the voices and the um, activity highlighted. Thank you. Okay, can we hear from our friends from Bihar? <laughs> One last short point. बस यही बोलना चाहते हैं कि विचार बदलो तो अपने आप लड़की आगे बढ़ेगी. Main है बदलाव लड़कियों के अंदर लाना. लड़कियां खुद अपना विचार बदलेगी, खुद वो बाहर गांव से बाहर निकलेगी, खुद role model बनेगी. तो जरूर ही बिहार की लड़की आगे तरक्की करेगी. Thank you. There are quite a lot of investors. This room, I would say, uh, can we have a small paradigm shift in investment? Uh, 
investing for change in thoughts, attitudes and behavior pattern rather than mere uh, putting the money into health and education. Trying to develop uh, the woman or the girl from the Indian village not merely on economic or physical levels but importantly on the emotional levels because that development on emotional levels will actually lead her to become a role model. I would like all of us to invest in trying to uh, promote role models at the mass level in the Indian, Indian village. Thank you so much. And I wanted, okay, you have one more point you're dying to make in the back, so <laughs> please do. I'm doing a fundraising program to uh, give a scholarship to the young journalist. I'm from India. So, uh, you know, I need uh, some, uh, people who can invest into this sort of uh, sustainable a scholarship program because uh, what he was saying role model I can understand just getting a job doesn't change your mindset I died on the gender issue coincidentally I'm also Bihari but born and brought up in Calcutta so I can understand the real situation of women in Bihar it's very difficult and funding is very much required for the women to work in a better place and for the better cause also so I'm going to say thank you for that it's a way to lead into the, we'd love for people to tweet, we'd love for people to get active around this. I, I was asking Patty, since I'm not based here, but um, there's so much work happening right here in India with the DFID team that is here, with the USAID team that is here, with accelerators and incubators that are here. If you are energized about this and you want to carry this conversation forward, one thing you can do is get in touch with Patty. Sure. Um, if that's okay, and with our friends from DFID who are sitting here, I just want to say uh, Sugand is here even though she's not, <laughs> she's not meant to be visible, I'm going to make her visible. <laughs> um, and I want to thank all of you for, for your time and let's uh, carry forward into lunch if we can. Okay, I just want to, I just want to raise visibility because I don't want to have to represent all the USA. Yeah. Um, so my two colleagues, uh, Mihal and Lina, who are actually here, um, run our, our um, private sector investment portfolio here in the India mission and our incredible supportive um, partners in gender lens investing and the platform we're trying to advance particularly here. So I would grab their attention as well Fantastic. in the middle right there. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.